Oftentimes people come to me thinking they have a retention problem, but they actually have a marketing problem. I want to share with you the six different aspects of marketing that directly impact retention, how to analyze them and what to do if you have a problem. When I start working with my clients, they're often surprised that as a retention consultant, I want to know about their marketing efforts and know their marketing lead. And the reason is, is because retention and marketing go together like peanut butter and jelly. They have a direct impact on each other. And I promise you that if you are missing the mark in these six core areas of marketing, it will impact your retention rate. Now, for those of you that are new to retention, you're still trying to learn your numbers, you don't even know what your retention or your lifetime value is, you're still trying to create a thriving community, I really want you to go to communitycreatorshub.com. You can get in there. It's totally free. I have resources that will help you start to really create a thriving community and know how to track these numbers. Now, for those of you that are a little bit more advanced, in fact, I really think this is for those of you that have a strong member journey in place, which means you've been through my Retain group consulting program, which is all about retention foundations. This is really for you all. However, I do want you to keep listening even if you're not quite at that stage, because this is something that's gonna be really important down the line. It's really important for you to start thinking about it now versus just banging your head against the wall when you feel like you can't move the retention needle and you're doing everything you can on the retention side, you may need to take a look at your marketing. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today is these six different areas of marketing that have a direct impact on your retention, starting with your target audience. Now this may seem really obvious, but who you target impacts the lifetime value of that customer. You might be converting a lot of people because you're really good at sales, but you're converting people who aren't a right fit customer. They're not a right fit. So they convert, but they don't stay very long. What's the best way to figure out who a right fit customer is? Well, it's to look at the people who retain the longest or stay the longest in your program. So this is where we go back to needing to know your lifetime value, length of stay, retention, all of those things that I help you track for free. Okay, but once you know your length of stay, let's say it's 10 months, then we need to look at those that stay longer than 10 months and start asking ourselves the question, what is different about this group of people? Then we start to craft a right fit customer based on the characteristics of our customers that stay the longest and get the best results. Once we know who our absolute ideal customer is, again, not because they convert the easiest, but because they stay the longest, that we can shift our target market, our target audience just enough to be able to attract more of those customers that are going to get their results, create the incredible stories, and stay longer. Because our higher lifetime value, we can actually pay more to acquire those customers as well. So first, target audience. Second is similar, but we're gonna take a little bit of a different spin on it, and that is messaging. Now, messaging definitely is impacted by your target audience, but there's another aspect of messaging that I wanna speak to. You wanna make sure that your messaging is aligned with your program purpose. So often I see people have really great webinars or really great freebies that convert really well, but they're actually not directly related to the purpose of the program. And they're really good at selling people on a particular webinar, but then once you get in the program, you realize that the focus is actually slightly different. It doesn't really feel like it's in alignment. So how do you fix this? Well, first off, like I talk about inside of my Retain program, you need to establish a solid member journey map. Everything that happens after the sale, you need to really understand and be clear about the progress that we're helping people make. Oftentimes people have one of those, and then they have a customer journey map, which is on the marketing side. We need to merge the two of those things so that we're looking at them in the same light and going, okay, from the moment somebody finds out about this until the time they cancel our membership, what does that journey look like and how do we make sure it's smooth and seamless and congruent and they feel like they're making progress towards the same goal, whether they're watching us on Instagram, listening to our podcast, or they're a paid member inside our highest level coaching program, do they feel like they're moving towards a similar goal? What we don't want is a big, ugly friction gap between your free stuff and your paid stuff to where you have all this free stuff and then they join the paid stuff and it's a different vision, a different purpose than what's paid. So we wanna make sure that our messaging is aligned so that when they get into our program, they're like, yes, of course, I've already been making progress towards this. This is what they said to expect and that's what I'm getting. 
And then second is promoting unrealistic results in your messaging. I know it is so tempting to only share the best success stories and the best case studies, to paint the picture of the millions you can make or you know, the perfect family that you can have or the amazing marriage or whatever it is that you're teaching. But the reality is, is that's gonna be hard for most people to achieve. But there are small wins or stories that maybe aren't as much of the wow factor that are valuable. Why? Because first off, people can relate to those better. It feels more possible for them. So they believe that it's possible for them, which is really important in marketing. But second, because they can actually feel like they're making progress towards the goal easier once they get in the membership. They feel like they're getting some quick wins, which don't feel so small in comparison to these big unrealistic goals that you've been pitching them. So you can have unrealistic goals. You can have unrealistic testimonials if you want, but you want to make sure to include some things that are much smaller, much more realistic so that when they get in the program, they start making progress. They don't feel like they're miles and miles away from the result. Okay. Target audience and then messaging. Next is offer. There's four aspects of the offer that are so important. And I'm not talking about like, you should have a cheaper price or you should go quarterly versus monthly or anything like that. What I want to talk about is four things. First and most important, is your offer valid or are you over-promising and under-delivering? Are you over-promising and under-delivering? We spend so much time becoming really good marketers and really good copywriters that we have that absolute epidemic of people over-promising and under-delivering because you put 90% of your effort on marketing and 10% on actually delivering results. It is my mission in our online business space to change that. Because I promise you, if you put just as much effort towards getting people results and retaining them in your programs, it will congruently, it will impact your marketing because you'll have better stories, you'll have more testimonials, you'll have more referrals when you produce better results. And here's the problem. When we overpromise and underdeliver, people leave because they think you're a liar because you said you were gonna do a thing and you didn't, because you said it was gonna be an incredible experience and it wasn't, because you promised that they were gonna build relationships and lifelong friends in the community and they didn't. So when you think about what you're promising in your offer, I really want you to be thinking about those most important things that overcome their key objections. We don't need to give them everything and the kitchen sink that they get once they get inside of the program. They don't need to know all of the wonderful aspects. You don't need to tell them that because Sally has this amazing lifelong friend she built in the community, you're gonna build that too. What we need to do is make sure that we focus on the core deliverables inside of our membership, core aspects of our program that are gonna overcome their objections. And then when they get in the program, we've left some wow. We've left some surprise and delight that is going to make them feel like we underpromised and over delivered. We're always leaving room for wow. Secondly, is bonuses under your offer. Many bonuses are only focused on an incentive to convert. So they're quick action bonuses. Once you get in, you're going to get this PDF, which is going to help you do this thing. Oftentimes, people get the bonus because they wanted that live training, they wanted that PDF, they wanted that discount or whatever it might be, and then they leave because that bonus was so juicy, they had to get it, but then they're just gonna cancel. But what if we had bonuses that not only helped people convert, but actually helped them stay as well? So if we think about bonuses that have to do with retention, it might be a quarterly workshop or a quarterly check-in call. It might be something that is a big event that's gonna happen six months from now, but they have to be a member in good standing to get that thing. Having bonuses that relate not only to conversion, but also help with retention is a big win for you because it's gonna increase the lifetime value of your customer. The third thing I wanna look for under offer is trials. I so often have people come to me who are showing me their retention rates and they are pitiful, like 50%, 60%, 70%, really bad retention rates. And then when we start dialing in, I realize they have a free trial or a dollar trial and they're actually including trial conversion in their retention number. So we had 100 people in the trial, only 50 people stayed the next month. That's gonna have a drastic impact on your retention rate. These two things should actually be separate. You need to track your trial conversions, so people who paid the dollar or got in for free, but then actually converted to a full paying member after the trial, separately from retention. They don't get included in the retention number until they are a full paying member after the trial, okay? 
That alone is gonna help you with your retention analysis. But the second thing to think about is just trials in general, and are they a good fit for us? You know, I want you to look at people who join outright versus people who join through a trial and look at their retention rate and see if it's even worth it to have the trial experience. Especially if you have a community, having trials can actually be a negative because people are just constantly churning in the community. They're in there to just test the waters. They're not actually a good fit. What I find is that people use trials as down sells. And oftentimes we've done a really good job of marketing, but that person in their head has said, this is not a fit for me right now which is a fine decision to make. And then we offer them a trial that they can't resist, a free trial or a dollar trial. But when they get in the program, guess what? It's still not a fit for them. It's still not something they're ready for. So what I would rather you do, other than offering a trial as a down sell, is to offer a down sell that is gonna help them get ready to be a perfect fit for your program so that when you offer it again, it's a no-brainer. Fourth thing we're gonna look for under offer are discounts. Now there are two different ways to look at discounts. Discounts for everybody or discounts for a select group. I don't like discounts for everybody, right? So if you just are a human, you're gonna get $47 off your first month, which saves you 50%, and then you're gonna go into your full payment. Well, we tend to have a really big drop off from the first month to the second month when we offer that kind of just arbitrary, anybody can get a discount because they see the difference in the cost. And when they you sold them on thinking, is this worth $49 or $47 or whatever it is they had to pay, not is this worth $97, okay? And so they have to convince themselves again between month one and month two that it's worth paying twice as much. That's a lot for you and your team who's building out your member journey and building out a strong onboarding. It can be done, but it is a lot. What I would rather you do if you're doing a discount is offer a selective discount. This usually comes if you have a paid launch, like a paid challenge or a paid coaching week. Let's say they pay $50 for that coaching week and then when they become a member, they get to apply that $50 discount to their first month. We've already filtered out everybody else. So we have gotten them to put their money down and say they're interested. We've gotten them to commit to hanging out with us for a few days before we even pitch them the offer. And then now they're joining the membership. So they've gone through some filters before they're getting that discount, which means that they are more likely to retain than just the everyday person getting the discount. But when you have a discount like this, it does require a really strong 45 day member journey really strong onboarding, because if we don't get those people convinced that it's worth the higher price, then they're gonna leave as soon as you start charging them more. All right, so we're looking at target audience, we're looking at messaging, we're looking at the offer. The next thing you're gonna be looking at is the channel. What channel is leading to the higher lifetime value customer? There's a couple of ways to look at this. One is organic versus paid. Some of you are spending a lot of money to acquire customers who have a very low lifetime value because they don't stick, and your organic customers have a much higher lifetime value because they retain for a long time, but you're doubling down on your paid advertising versus your organic content. That's not good. So we wanna track organic versus paid for sure. But the other thing you wanna look at is channel. So for example, Instagram versus YouTube versus Pinterest versus an affiliate, right? Who, where are the highest lifetime value customers coming from? This does require tracking, it does require tagging. And then I talk about cohort retention a lot on this podcast, but this is a different kind of cohort retention. It's not looking at all of these people came from a launch, how did they retain? It's looking at the retention rate and lifetime value based on where a person came from, what channel they came from. So did the lead come from YouTube? Did it come from Facebook? And how do the YouTube people retain versus the Facebook people? So when we're able to look at that, it helps us know where we need to double down our efforts and where maybe we're attracting a whole bunch of not right fit people and we need to either revise our strategy on that channel or just stop wasting our time on that channel. All right, next is gonna be, well, I'm just gonna call it length of nurture. It's really length of time on the email list. And the reason being is because we can't really track how long somebody's followed us on Instagram or how long they've been subscribed to our podcast, but it's possible you have texting or something else like that that people can be subscribed to, right? But what I'm talking about is how long have you been nurturing them? And the really, the thing most people can measure is the email list, so that's the context in which we're gonna talk about it. Let's think about it this way. It's warm audience versus colder audience. We know that warmer audiences convert better than colder audiences, but are we also looking at the fact that they retain better? Here's a way to think about this, okay? A list launch 
versus an evergreen launch. So let's say you do a flash sale launch for 48 hours. You only send emails to your existing email list. You don't do any ads, you don't do any social promotion, and you get new members. And on the other hand, you run evergreen ads to an audience who may not know you. We're not talking about retargeting ads or anything like that. You're just running evergreen ads. Somebody sees your invite to a webinar, they watch it, they convert, and you get a member. Which of those do you think is likely to retain the longest? It is almost always the person that was on your list because they've been nurtured for longer. Now that may not always be true, but what you do wanna look at, especially after a launch when you can, is length of time on your list. How long was the average person on your list or the median? What's the median amount of time that was on your list? And you can do the same type of cohort retention breakdown for these people. They've been on our list less than a month. They've been on our list for three months. They've been on our list for six months or more than a year. And then you can break down the retention time for that. What will this tell you? Well, if you do flash sales, if you do offer, make offers to your list, you might be able to determine the ideal time to do a flash sale or the ideal time to make an offer based on how long they've been on the list because you know that people who have been on for at least three months retain significantly more in the membership than people who are brand new. So that's one way to look at it. But length of nurture is definitely going to impact their retention. The final marketing element we wanna look at is the conversion method. How are you getting these people to convert? The simplest way to look at it is free versus paid. Free might bring us in a whole lot more conversions than paid because we have a barrier to entry to a paid challenge or a paid coaching week, right? But do people that convert from a paid challenge or a paid coaching week retain a lot better and have a much higher lifetime value? Maybe. So if we can measure the lifetime value of somebody who comes in through a a free launch effort versus a paid launch effort, we may do the math and actually find out that although we get less conversions, it's actually way more profitable for us to do paid challenges or paid launches. So that's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is based on commitment level. Is it easy to commit or harder to commit? So if we think about a challenge, there's lots of friction points. There's lots of drop-off points, if you will. Somebody needs to stick with us for a little while before we make that offer. They need to join the group. They need to watch the videos. They need to participate. It requires a higher commitment level on their end versus, say, an evergreen webinar where they can click a button, they can get an on-demand. They don't even have to like check their email. It's literally right there. They watch that 30 to hour-long webinar, and then they have the opportunity to join. Which one is going to produce a higher lifetime value customer? Well, typically, the higher lifetime value customer is the person who's already had to jump through a whole bunch of hoops to even get to the offer to be able to join, not the person who had the very low commitment of just giving you their email address so that they could watch a one-hour webinar really quick. So when we think about conversion method, we're thinking about free versus paid, and we're thinking about commitment level, but also content. I had one client one time who probably had six different webinar topics and very different webinar topics. And one of the webinars converted really well. The topic was really random and not super directly related to the membership. So when we started looking at it, they wanted to double down on just that webinar. But when we actually started looking at it, those people retained the worst. So it didn't make any sense for us to double down on that webinar. If we were just looking at marketing metrics, we would have made the mistake and doubled down on that webinar that it was the highest converting webinar. But because we included retention metrics and we could look at the lifetime value and see how poor these people were retaining, we made a different decision to take another webinar topic and actually just really improve upon that. Because if people converted on that webinar, they stayed significantly longer than the average member. So if we could just get more people on that webinar, then we can get more people into the membership that are gonna have a higher lifetime value. So that's why conversion makes such a big difference. It's essentially like pre-onboarding. That's how I want you to think about it. Your launch mechanism, your conversion mechanism should be pre-onboarding for your membership. That way they already feel like they're a part of it once they get the opportunity to join. And what you're doing inside of your onboarding is reiterating things that they already learned and heard about inside of your conversion mechanism. The better we do at connecting our conversion mechanism and our conversion teaching and training and experience, 
to the teaching training experience messaging that they're going to get inside of the membership, the more likely they are to retain. Okay, so when we're talking about how marketing and retention work together, we're looking at six different areas. We're looking at the target audience, the messaging, the offer, the channel, the length of time on the list or, or length of nurture, and then the conversion method. All six of those are going to have a direct impact on your retention rate. So if you've been doing the work, let's say you've taken the Cultivate Community Training course, let's say you've been in my Retain Group coaching program and you have your member journey map in place, but you're scaling so much that those little tenth of a percentages matter so much in being able to scale or not scale, then I want you to kind of turn your eyes away from the member experience and over to your marketing department to try and figure out how your marketing could be positively or negatively impacting your retention rate. And here's the deal. I understand this is a lot. I understand this is a lot of work, a lot of data to be thinking about. Most of you are not ready for it and that is okay. You have work to do. You need to take Cultivate. You need to get a thriving community. You need to have a member journey map that you create through Retain, right? You're in one of those stages. That's the majority of you and that's totally fine. Focus on the thing, the foundational thing that you need to get in place first. But if you have somebody in marketing, not you business owner, not I'm the marketing person and I'm gonna get distracted by this project when I still haven't really figured out conversions or retention. But if you have a marketing person that is responsible for marketing, I want you to send them this episode because there are tags that they can start applying now that although you may not be ready to analyze them, you may not be ready to track their retention, when you are ready, because you have that thriving community, you have that strong member journey in place and your retention is solid and you're ready to tweak to get that little bit of a retention increase, when you're ready to do that, you have the data you need. The problem that I find when I start working with clients is that I want to do this type of analysis, but I can't because they don't have the tags. You can start tagging today, but it's going to take you six months to a year to have enough data to be able to look and see, are people retaining longer from different channels? We're just not going to have enough data if we haven't, if we don't have enough people tagged that have been with the membership for a year or more, right? The data doesn't exist. So what you can do today is send this to your marketing person and ask them what tags can they start applying now that you can use for cohort retention tracking later. That's the only takeaway that you have. I want you to ignore all of the other things if you don't already have your cultivate plan in place and if you don't already have your retain member journey map in place. Okay. Hopefully this is helpful. And even if you're not at the later stages of like this advanced sort of retention talk, hopefully it's giving you insight. Now, even in when you're crafting your webinar or your next challenge, you can be thinking about how you can be crafting it in a way that might lead to higher retention and higher lifetime value in the future.